Good morning. First Thessalonians. Well, actually, just turn to Nehemiah 8. That's where we're going to be uh, looking. So, But I, I want to read 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we come to you this morning to give you thanks and praise for this day, and thank you for uh, many blessings that you have poured out this year, Lord. God, it's been a year of blessings, a year of trials, a year of suffering for some, a year of rejoicing for others. But Lord, in all things, we do give you the glory and the honor. We do magnify Christ in our hearts and in our minds and our lives, in our jobs and our families, in all that we do, Lord. We seek to bring glory and honor to you. And Father, where we fail and fall short in that endeavor, Lord, I pray that your Spirit would convict us of sin and remind us, God, that this life is not about us, but about you about your glory and our relationship to you. And Lord, we pray that this morning that you would attend the study of your word. And I pray, God, that you would fill our hearts as we engage this text, Lord, and that we see the principles that you have laid out for us, God. And I pray that you would move us, Father, and that we would be convicted and transformed Lord, that we be prepared for the year to come. And so, Father, we give you thanks and praise this day for the fact that we can gather together peacefully in the study of your word. And I pray, God, that we would be very aware of that and and make the most of it, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would speak deeply into our hearts now as we open this text. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, sermons come in all types and sizes. They can be topical, expositional, formal, casual, instructive, exhortive, passionate, calm, witty, serious, practical, philosophical, you know, long, short, and so on and so on. But one thing a sermon to really be a biblical sermon must be is the proclamation of God's Word. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, uh, Paul refers to himself uh, and referring to the gospel, he says, to which I was appointed a preacher. And this word preacher in the Greek is kerux, and it means herald. Now, uh, basically the definition is a that it's a herald or messenger vested with public authority who conveyed the official messages of kings, magistrates, princes, military commanders, uh, or, or who gave a public summons or, or demand, or who performed various other duties. So the herald was an important person in this culture. And how do you suppose a herald's message was received in those days? considering that often it would come from a king or a military commander. What attitude would it be met with? What if one were to simply ignore the message of the herald? Or hear it and affirm the message, but then simply fail to act on it? When your commander calls you to, to arms and calls you to service and you're still in the barracks, sitting around doing nothing. You know, what would, what would have happened? What, what was expected of people who received messages uh, from their herald, from a herald? And I, I think that there is, a, in fact, an expectation upon the recipient of the message that was being proclaimed. That there was an attitude that they would be, be expected to have, to take it seriously, uh, to act upon the message. And I think it's the same with the proclamation of God's Word. There is a certain expectation on the recipient. So to get an idea then, 
of how to receive the proclamation of God's word. We're going to look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. I, I read our, our text just to open uh, with some, some principles there. And we'll, get, we'll go back to that. But I really want to focus on uh, Nehemiah 8. Because Nehemiah 8, in this chapter we see the people of Israel. These are, these are those who have returned from captivity. And they're gathered together for the reading and the exposition of the book of the law, which constituted Israel's covenant document. In essence, they, they read the text and then they gave the sense of the meaning. So in essence, it's a sermon. Now, if you think I preach long... They went on for about four hours, half a day on this, and they did it for several days in a row. Uh, so, uh, no more complaining about long sermons. Uh, they're biblical. But from this text, we can draw several principles then on how to listen to a sermon or to listen to the proclamation of God's Word. All right, so let's look at uh, these principles that, that we find in... Nehemiah chapter 8. First we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 on preparing to hear God's word. It says, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in the front of the water gate. And they, <laughs> I never noticed the pun there, water gate. Excuse me. That's too, old, too some of y'all too young for that. Come on, water gate. That's a good joke. They don't get any better, guys, so you've got to laugh at those. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now notice that they are gathered together. That's one of the first things that we, we see here. Now, we can obviously proclaim the gospel to an individual. And we can disciple individuals. But there is something about God's people gathered together. There's just something about that where... Where when, when, or even just people are gathered together and God's word is proclaimed, that it's an occasion for the movement of God's spirit upon that crowd. Whether it's for redemption, like in Acts chapter 2, or condemnation, like in Acts chapter 7, something about the proclamation of God's word to, God, to, a, to a crowd of people occasions the, the movement of God's spirit on the hearts of the people present. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're commanded to gather together on a regular basis. We're gathered to, we, we gather together to come under the proclamation of God's Word. Not just a fellowship, not just a pray, uh, not just a sing, those are all good things. But we come to gather together for the proclamation of the Word of God. In fact, Hebrews 10, 24 says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. There's, there is a, a, a special, I don't know how to describe it, something special happens when the people of God are gathered together and the word is proclaimed, and the exhortation goes forth. And God's spirit begins to move. You see in Acts chapter, I'm not Acts, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul talks about when they prophesy, that if all prophesy, that they'll know there's a God among you, because he'll, their hearts will be discerned, basically. And I don't know if I've, I think I've told y'all this story, but one time I went down to uh, do beach reach, ministry on, uh, on spring break down at Galveston, I mean not Galveston, uh, South Padre Island. And, and I'd been there one year before, but this is the second year I was there. And so we go pulling up to the church and they were already started. And as I opened the, and it was very much like this, you had side doors and then those back doors like that. So it's almost exact same arrangement. And as I come through those side doors, somebody burst through those doors, this, this lady, she says, I gotta get out of here. And I didn't know what in the world is going on. And she was just 
panicked. And I was like, and so people come chasing her out. And what I found out was, and because they sat her down and talked to her, and I was there, so I just joined in, you know. What's going on? You all right, y'all? And, and they started talking to her, and they explained to her, you're under the conviction of God. This woman had been, a, had been saved about a week before that, and she had been saved out of prostitution. And, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit was upon her, so much so that she had to flee the scene. You know, she didn't understand it. She just had to get out of there. Well, something about the, the gathering of God's people and the proclamation of God's word, God begins to move. And I think that's why he wants us to gather together regularly, you know, to, to be a part of the assembly and what's going on. I don't think you'll really grow in Christ if you're consistently absent and not sitting under the proclamation of God's word. I just don't think you will. I think you'll stagnate. I, I think you may be saved and you may, you, you, you know, you may hit and miss here and there, but I don't think you're going to have consistent growth in Christ unless you are consistently under that proclamation. So the first principle that we see is the gathering together of the saints. The second thing is the, the recognition of the authority of the Word of God. And they told, it says, they, and they told Ezra, the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. They didn't just bring any old book. They, they didn't bring Aristotle's metaphysics up there, or his logic. They brought the word of God. They, they brought the authority of God's word to bear, and they recognized it. This is their covenant book. This is a book by which they were constituted a nation before God. This is their covenant document. It has all the authority for them as a people. And so they recognized it. And remember what our text said in 1 Thessalonians? That Paul says, You received the word of God which you heard from us. You welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. It's the Word of God. It's, it's what God has spoken. It's what He has declared. It's what He's proclaimed. And they gathered together recognizing this is our covenant with God. This is God's Word, which is life. Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is life. This is sustaining life. And if we don't gather together and, and put ourselves under the proclamation of God's word, we're going to begin to die and shrivel because this is life. We feast upon God's word. So we gather together, we recognize the authority of God's word, and we have ears to hear. It says, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. They were attentive. See, they were prepared to listen. They knew that past failure had resulted in the desolation and deportation of the nation. They knew what had happened. They understood that they had been kicked out of the land because they violated the covenant. And this remnant had returned and they needed to know how to avoid the same failure. And the key was to listen with the heart to God's word. They prepared their hearts to receive. They prepared their hearts to have ears to hear. Ezekiel 3.10, God says to him, He says, Moreover, God said to me, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you, and hear with your ears. That's an admonition from God to prepare your heart to hear, to have ears that hear, to be prepared to receive His word. Contrast this with those to whom Ezekiel was sent. In Ezekiel 12, verses 1 through 2, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see but does not see, and ears to hear but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. They have ears to hear, and they have eyes to see, but they won't because they're in rebellion against God. They refuse to hear. And we see here people prepared to receive the Word of God. They listened attentively. 
Now, when we gather together under the proclamation of God's word, it, it might be a word to us in the sense that it might be a rebuke for something going on in our life. It may be a comfort because of trials we're going through. It may be an exhortation to endeavor more. It may be a confirmation of the work that God has done in your life. It may be an invitation to join God in doing something or into an invitation into relationship with Him if you don't know Christ. There's no telling what God might say to you on any given Sunday. There's no telling what the Word is going to bring forth for your life. But you have to come prepared to hear. If you don't come prepared to hear, you may not hear what God's Word is saying to you. So those are some principles for preparing to hear God's Word. Now we need some principles for hearing God's Word. Now, in verses 4-8, through eight, we see that we need to be an active listener. Verse 4, So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of which they, of which they uh, excuse me, platform of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him, at his right hand, stood a whole bunch of guys with long names. And in his left hand, there was a whole bunch more guys with long names. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, another bunch of guys with long names uh, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place, so they read distinctly from the book and the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the meaning. So they, they instructed the people. They read God's Word and they taught them what it meant. Now notice the ways in which they interacted with God's Word. First, they stood. They stood while God's Word was read. They, they, uh, uh, they, they responded with Amen when Ezra blessed God. Now, I don't know if y'all were here last week, but somebody was here. I think it was uh, Eric's drummer's father or somebody. Somebody was over in this corner amening. Vociferously amening. I loved it. So don't feel shy. You know, that, 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 helps, that, that helps me to know that you're awake. See, I know that he's not awake because he's not making any noise. Then I went and put him back there, put, took him back there and put him to sleep. But, but you know, I, I, I know that you're awake and listening when you amen. Now, now don't be like the one guy that, that <laughs> was at a church one time and was in Kerrville. And we went, it was Sunday evening. And, and I think it was the youth, I mean, the music guy. The pastor was preaching and every other word was amen, amen, amen. And at some point, the pastor said something you certainly did not want to amen. And it was like, amen, oh. <laughs> He's just in the habit of saying amen. But the point here is not that you need to say amen per, uh, per se, but that they responded to God's word. They declared amen when God was praised and they lifted up their hands. They interacted with what was going on. They bowed their heads in worship and they endured patiently while they were given the sense or meaning of the text. Now when I say they endured patiently, I mean they endured for four hours. They, they were patient. Now I don't know if they stood the whole four hours. Uh, today we couldn't do that, but back in those days that probably wasn't uh, uncommon. People were used to standing. I mean, retail people do that all the time. And uh, standing for four hours is... If you're used to it, it's not that big a deal. Yeah, we have Wendy shaking her head back there. She knows. In fact, there are some churches today in the Greek Orthodox um, tradition that have no seats in their churches. You stand the whole service. 
you know, we could get our nice cushiony <laughs> seats and, you know. But the, the point is, they interacted, they stood, they bowed, they, they endured patiently while they were given the sense or meaning of the text. Now, they were active listeners. And if you listen passively, what's going to happen? You're going to zone out, or you're going to fall asleep, you know. You're going to start snoring. I mean, it, it, if you're not actively engaged, unless, unless a speaker is just so dynamic that you can't not be engaged, you don't have that blessing at this church. So uh, this is how I'm trying to help you get more out of what I'm doing. Actively engage the message. You know, a lot of times I ask questions. Answer the questions if you can. Say an amen here and there. Do something to keep your mind engaged. Take notes. I didn't give you your notes this morning. I didn't have time to get them done, but I uh, woke up a little bit late this morning. But you can always bring your notepad and take notes. Interact. Be an active listener. And then be a responsive listener. It says, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They responded to what they heard by worshiping God. You know, often people react just the opposite as we're warned in Hebrews. Hebrews 12 verse 25 says, See that you do not refuse Him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused Him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from Him who speaks from heaven whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shall shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Don't refuse or reject what God is saying. Heed that. In other words, respond to it. We're not only to actively listen, we're to respond positively to what we have heard. We are to receive it, even when it's unpleasant. Remember, remember, you, you see this response, this, this difference of response in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 2, they accused, uh, Peter accused this group of Jews of killing the Messiah. And they were cut to their heart. And it says that they, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They heard it. And they responded positively with, a recognition of their sin and and they received this this basically this charge of a criminal act you're a murderer and not only are you a murderer guess who you murdered the messiah you murdered the messiah and they were willing to hear that and they said oh no oh no what do we do what do we do Compare that with Acts chapter 7. Same message. Same sin. Same accusation of criminal act. You murdered the Messiah. And what they do? They stopped up their ears. And they ran at him and gnashed at him with their teeth. And then they took him and stoned him. We have to shut up the messenger. We have to stop this word. We have to put an end to this because I do not want to hear this. It's not true that I would murder and especially not true that I'd murder the Messiah. How dare you say that? I'm going to put an end to your speaking. I'll put an end to my hearing and if I can't, if that doesn't work, I'll put an end to your speaking. Is that how you come to receive God's word? To tune it out? To shut it out? Or do you come willing to hear the ugly truth? You know, people come to counseling all the time and <laughs> a lot of times that's not what they're willing to hear is the ugly truth. And sometimes it's hard to say it to them. 
But they come for counsel, but they don't want to heed it. They don't want they want you to tell them what they want to hear. So be responsive. Be engaged. Consider the, the message. Consider it. Meditate on it. Embrace it as true and sift out anything that is contrary to God's word or goes beyond what Scripture has revealed. If somebody's preaching, me or anybody else, and they, they're contrary to the word, sift that out. Keep the, the, the wheat and get rid of the chaff. And I guarantee you, I've preached, a, well, let's see, 52 weeks in a year, seven years, and let's say I've missed you know, 20 or 30 of those. So I've, I've preached a lot of sermons here. I guarantee you there's a lot of chaff. A lot of things that need to be sifted out. But I know this, that I have endeavored to bring to you the Word of God. That I have endeavored to make known to you the sense of God's Word. And you're responsible to every last minute of those sermons in which I was faithful to God's Word. To hear it, to respond to it, to receive it. You're held accountable before God for every sermon you've ever listened to from me or anyone else. Either to sift out the, the garbage and reject it or to receive the Word. Now, I'm not saying that He's going to examine us minutely but the point is that he's presented his word to you. You have no excuse for not hearing it, for not receiving it, and for the final thing, for not heeding it, because that's the third principle, heeding God's word. Now, how do we heed God's word? Well, in verses 13 through 18, we see that we are to walk in obedience. It says, Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel, Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of oil trees, myrtle, tree, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. And the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in their, in their courtyards or the courts of the house of God, and in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. And they were, there was very great gladness. Also, day by day, from the first day until the last day, Ezra read from the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. According to the prescribed manner. In other words, there had been years and years and years of disobedience. And when God's word was proclaimed to them, and they saw that they were to do this. What did they do? They went out and did it. They walked in obedience to what God said. Imagine that. Wow. We actually apply God's word to our life. Christians so often fail to do this. We don't implement God's commands in real life ways. We hear what is being said, but ignore it in our own life. You know one of the main areas that I find that this is true? One of the main areas in which people just refuse to hear the Word of God? It's when it comes to marriage and divorce. I don't know why, but I've, I've talked to people before, and you can lay out some principles from God's Word, and they don't care. I'm going to marry that guy anyways. I don't care if he's a believer or not. I'm sorry. God's Word teaches us about this. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of other areas too. 
I don't know why, but that one, I guess I just notice it sometimes. James 1.23 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, and then he goes away and forgets who he is. You know, in other words, you're a hearer of the word, but not a doer. We can sit here every Sunday and listen to the word of God. And it's, and it's you know, it's comforting and it's, it's moving or, or it's a nice nap or whatever. You know, see? <laughs> but are we doing it? Are we living out what we've come? We're taking two or three hours out of our day on Sundays for the purpose of sitting under a sermon and then we get sleepy and ignore what's being said. I mean, I, I know, I, I've been there. I've been under many sermons and I start getting, I'm probably far worse than anybody in this room about that, getting sleepy in the middle of a sermon. But you know what? If we come prepared and recognize what is going on, that God's word is being delivered to us and proclaimed to us, we prepare ourselves to hear the word, and then we hear the word, and then walk away and not be a doer of the word, that's inconsistent. We must also be a doer of the word. We must walk in obedience. And what happens if we realize under the proclamation of God's word that we haven't been walking in obedience? We repent. This is verses, uh, chapter 9 actually, verses 1 through 3. Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel was, uh, were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Signs of repentance. Signs of mourning. They were mourning their disobedience. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. So for a fourth, they read and acknowledged the, the word, and then for another fourth, they confessed and worshipped God. So they knew that they and their forefathers had violated God's covenant. And they knew that the consequences of that were their dispersal. They knew the problems that they had in life as a nation were a direct result of disobedience to God's word. Now, that doesn't mean that every problem that you've ever had is because you're committing a sin. That's not true. We know that from Job, right? But so many times, I think that people are in trouble because they're violating God's Word. I mean, if you're living out God's Word, how often are you going to land in jail for any other reason but being a martyr? You're probably not going to land in jail. If you're not out selling drugs, not out murdering and stealing and doing all those things, if you're walking in obedience to God, you're going to go to jail. You may not even suffer in other ways if you're walking in obedience. Paul says in Romans that the sin of homosexuality carries within your own body the penalty of it. You know, you think of the diseases that they, that they incur that are almost, uh, almost only related to that, to that activity. You know, male homosexuals, even before AIDS, had a life expectancy of 40 years. 40 years! They were in a self-destructive behavior. And God's Word would save them from that. Just obedience to it. What self-destructive behaviors have we engaged in? That we're not obedient to God and we don't listen to God and so therefore we suffer. 
They read it for a fourth of the day. They confessed for a fourth of the day. They worshipped for a fourth of the day. See, they walked in repentance. They knew they were guilty and then confessed their sin. Uh, this reminds me of, of uh, um, the event in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8. It says, Then Hilkiah the high priest, this is when they were rebuilding the temple, it says, Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Then Shaphan, or Shaphan, or how do you say this guy's name? Uh, then Shaphan, the scribe, showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now it happened, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, uh, Ahakam, the son of Shaphan, Akbar, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe and Isaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do, to do according to all that is written concerning us. When he read the book, he was convicted of sin. When you sit under a sermon, and God's word is brought to you, often there's conviction of sin. And what do you do with it? Do you run out the doors trying to flee as fast as you can? I need to get this church service over so I can go home and forget all about what I just heard. So I don't have to deal with it. Is that your response to God's word? Or is it, men and brethren, what shall we do? The wrath of God was upon that nation. And the king said, we're in trouble. God help us. What do we do? If we have sinned and God's word convicts us, we need to respond appropriately. And one principle to, uh, regarding that is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to be honest about our sin and deal with it. So, to conclude, we have a sermon every week. We have the Word of God proclaimed every week. Whether it's a short, devotional type sermon or it's a long long-winded, expositional-type sermon, whether it's witty or, or not, or whether it's deep teaching or just some, in, some encouragement, God's Word is going to be proclaimed from this pulpit every week. How are you going to come every week? Are you going to come prepared to hear God's Word? Are you going to come to pre be prepared to, to hear you, one way you prepare is by getting here, by being here. I understand sometimes we have to miss, we go on vacation or whatever. I get that. Uh, but sometimes we fail to prepare ourselves to hear the sermon by failing to get here. I can, I, I, I can name several friends of mine whose walk with Christ has suffered tremendously because they got, when their kids got old enough to involve them in sports, they abandoned church on Sunday to go to do sports. I can give you names of people who have, whose, Christian, or whose spiritual life has suffered because of that choice. We need to be gathered together to hear the proclamation of God's Word. And then when we get here with attentive ears and prepared hearts, we need to actually hear God's word we need to listen attentively or guess what you may not hear what God actually has to say you know you, you may just tune out what God is trying to do in your life and you miss the blessing of God's word so we need to be here to hear God's word and finally we need to heed God's word because if you don't heed God's word, 
you will be a hearer only and not a doer. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we come to you praying, God, that you would enable us to hear. Give us ears to hear. Lord, enable us, Father, to be prepared in our hearts to receive your word. We pray for the grace, God, that comes from hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Lord, I pray that when your word is proclaimed, it would produce faith in us. It would turn our hearts to you. That we would not be in rebellion. That we would not resist the proclamation of your word. We would not reject the proclamation of your revelation. But rather that we would receive it in meekness and humility. And that you would produce in us a trust in your word. A confidence in your word. A confidence in the gospel. A confidence in Christ. That you would endue faith into our souls, Lord. That you would endow us, God, with belief. And Father, that we would heed your word. That we would then go and be a doer of your word. Lord, that we would not be like those in Israel who heard the word for centuries and never walked in obedience to the commands, Lord. And Father, they suffered the consequences of that. I pray, Lord, that you would instruct us, Lord. Exhort us. Convict us. Comfort us. God, cause us to rejoice through your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.